has gradually become clear to me what every great philosophy up till now has consisted of, namely the confession of its originator and a species of involuntary and unconscious autobiography. Well, that's a deceptive, that's a deceptively simple sentence, even though it's not a particularly simple sentence, because it, it stands on its head what people generally assume about the process of thinking. You generally think that when you're thinking, you're thinking about, as I mentioned before, the structure of the objective world. But, but Nietzsche is, is making an entirely different point here. And what he's fundamentally doing is treating the philosopher not as a rational being, but as a living being. And there's a big difference between being a rational being and being a living being. Because if you're a living being, your primary goal is to do whatever it is that furthers your life. And if you're a rational being, then your primary goal is to do whatever it is that a rational being might do. And you could say that a living being should first and foremost be a rational being. And in some sense, that's the message of the, of the Western Enlightenment. But it's by no means self-evident that that's the case. And it's certainly not something that Nietzsche, Nietzsche doesn't believe that people are rational beings certainly not primarily and more importantly he isn't exactly convinced that they should be so so for example one of Nietzsche's most famous maxims is that truth serves life and that's a very difficult different idea than the purpose of truth say is the accurate representation of the objective world those aren't the same thing at all now you could ask well what does it mean for truth to serve life and if you construed truth that way what would truth look like and you know the mere statement that truth should serve life doesn't offer you the answers to those questions, but but it, it's the beginning of a different metaphysics, and in some sense a metaphysics which is, say, the universe within which a philosopher might operate. A metaphysics is the initial structure of presuppositions within which a view of the world is organized. One presupposition might be human beings are rational and that we're attempting to formulate and improve our sense of the objective world, our formulation of the objective world. And another would be that human beings aren't rational, we're irrational, and that we're, what we're motivated to do is to live, whatever that means, and that the purpose of our thinking and our philosophy should be to facilitate our living. And that's Nietzsche's, that's one of the foundation blocks of Nietzsche's philosophy. So he's a moral philosopher fundamentally, because morality is about values, and values essentially, values are, you could say values are what you aim for, but it's more complicated than that. Values actually constitute the lens through which you view the world, so it's partly what you're aiming at, but it's also partly your conception of who you are now and where you are, and it's also partly your conception of how you're going to get to where it is that you want to be, and it's also partly the psychological system that you use to parse up the world so that it reveals to you the pathway that you can take to get to what you want. Value is all of that, and then it's more than that, because you could say that you have a value, which contains all of that, but then you could say that you have a set of values, which is the arrangement of all of that, and then you could say that you have a set of values that's the arrangement of all of that, that you have to arrange with other people. And then you could say that you have all that and you have to arrange it with other people and you have to arrange it across different spans of time because what you want today and what you want next week and what you want next month are not necessarily the same thing and one does not necessarily lead into the other. So to be a moral philosopher is to examine how that, what that system is and how it operates and how it came about. Now one of the things that Nietzsche says is it has gradually become clear to me what every great philosophy up till now has consisted of, namely the confession of its originator and a species of involuntary and unconscious autobiography. So his claim fundamentally is that no matter what the philosopher thinks he's doing while he's writing philosophy, what he's actually doing is revealing and articulating his being. And then you might say, well, where did that being come from? And the answer to that is, well, partly it's, you could consider it a biological function insofar as that we have value structures that are built into us that are the process, we would say the process of a 
very long evolutionary history. But because you're also a cultural phenomena and because the manner in which you've arranged your values and your desires has been conditioned to the last degree by the process of enculturation that you were subjected to, when you confess in an autobiographical manner and articulate that, what you're also doing is recapitulating the entire structure of your culture. It's in you. And you might say, well, where is it in you? And, that, that, and what does in you mean? Part of it means is that you act out a pattern of behavior. And that pattern of behavior is like a, a dance that someone is manifesting to a symphonic score. It's unbelievably complicated. And it has its psychological elements, and some of those are conscious and some of them aren't. Some of them are just implicit and embedded in the way you act and the way you perceive. And what the philosopher is attempting to do is to reveal those to himself and to articulate them so that the entire structure can be analyzed. Well, so Nietzsche's first proposition is that when a philosopher is thinking that what he's doing is not thinking, it's revealing himself in an autobiographical sense under the guise of rational thinking. And so then it becomes something more like a story. And, well, and he covers all that in the first two phrases. So that gives you some example, some indication of what this book is like. A species of involuntary and unconscious autobiography. Well, that's a more complicated idea, too, because you might say, well, why would someone be driven in an involuntary way, in an unconscious way, to describe their autobiography? And that's a very complicated question. It might be that one of the reasons that people value one another is because we engage in the process of sharing deeply autobiographical information. You tell me your story and I tell you my story and you might say, well, why, why do we even bother with such things? And the answer to that is, well, if you can tell me about the pain and tragedy that you encountered, then that gives me a better way of, that gives me a better vision of the dangers of the world without actually having to expose myself to those dangers, except in simulation. I might feel sorry for you, I might feel bad about your tragic experiences, but I'm not bleeding for them. And then there's always the possibility that you'll also tell me how you solved your problem, in which case I can either avoid that problem entirely, or if I do encounter, I can solve it without having to go through, maybe it took you decades to formulate your solution to that problem. And you can tell me your story, and then I have the information. And so that's part of what human beings are always trading. That's why we talk to each other. That's why we can communicate. And so Nietzsche would say, well, it's, it's involuntary and unconscious. Involuntary and unconscious. He's alluding to the fact that that proclivity is so deeply embedded in people, that, that desire to, to make an autobiographical recounting, that it serves as a, the kind of motivation that we don't question for doing almost everything that we do. So, you know, I mean, people do such things as attend movies and plays, and they usually do that happily, especially if the movie or the play is of high quality, and the same thing happens when people are reading novels. They're attracted to such things. They have a built-in value. It's very rarely the case that people will ever question why it is that they're doing such things. In fact, you see this quite commonly with students who are first introduced to their study of literature. The, the introduction of the idea that you should analyze what it is that you're engaged in when you're reading actually comes as unwelcome news to most people who are inclined towards fiction because they don't want to interfere with the process of engagement, you know, automatic unconscious engagement with the material by detaching themselves and having to think about what they're doing. So that's why it's an involuntary and unconscious. It's, 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 it's one of the things within which thought operates rather than one of the things on which thought operates. Then he says, the moral or immoral purpose in which every philosophy has constituted, sorry, the moral or immoral purpose in every philosophy has constituted the true vital germ out of which the entire plant has always grown. Well, that's a hell of a thing to say too, because what Nietzsche is alluding to there in some sense is that 